you're six months into the job. Yes. How's it going? It's great. I mean, there have been, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny for sure, but um, change is very hard. And we are working every day to make sure the system is understandable, um, just and equitable, and, um, and that we are helping people get the services that they need in the municipal and district courts. And then we're holding people accountable for serious crimes in our superior courts uh, and the few serious crimes we have in municipal and district courts too. Talking about the scrutiny, um, you are doing what you promised voters that you do. People knew that if you were elected, you weren't going to prosecute 15 low-level crimes. But once you were sworn in, there was a lot of pushback, especially from other top officials across the Commonwealth who say, look, this is not going to work. What's your response to those critics? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very funny when you tell people who you're going to be and then you are that person and they're surprised. Um, you know, I like to remind people that m a month before the primary, uh, a little more than a month, I put up my list of 15 crimes that in the first instance we wouldn't prosecute. Um, I then refined that after winning the primary and the general with a really large percentage of votes. So what I would argue is a mandate. So with over 80% of the vote in the general, Suffolk County said that they liked what I was proposing and I'm gonna hold myself accountable to the people that put me here. Um, now that I'm the DA, I represent everyone. So of course I'm gonna listen to the people that are skeptical um, and quite frankly, the people that disagree wholeheartedly with what I'm proposing because I'm their district attorney too. Um, what I will say though is that we are going to keep trying the things that I proposed, and I think I need to be given some time to actually see um, if those proposals work or not. And candidly, I think we are doing well. I really do. I think we're getting people um, treatment and services instead of sentences when they have mental health issues and substance use disorder or are homeless. Um, I want to really sort of put people in touch with all of the amazing services Mayor Walsh has or the city managers have in um, in Chelsea and Winthrop uh, or the mayor in Revere has, for example, um, as well as um, our governor, who we have some state services that are exceptional that I want them actively involved in people's lives and getting them treatment instead of me putting them in jail um, and not getting the services that they need when they're there. What would you say to the people who feel victim? What would you say to the people who feel victimized? Who say, "Listen, I was hurt by someone with a mental health issue, and I don't feel like that person is paying the consequence." I listen. I understand these are these are tough issues. That is exactly what um, happened, potentially, or could happen with respect to the EMS stabbing that we saw recently. Uh, a woman was. Um, being transported by our first responders who um, do an exceptional job every day protecting us and saving our lives and um, ultimately ended up stabbing one of the EMS workers and um, pepper spraying or uh, chemical spraying um, the driver of the car. And a judge found that um, she was going to be held um, at her arraignment to determine um, whether she's competent or not. So we, she's going to be for 20 days held inpatient um, to get uh, a, determin a, a determination as to whether or not she can stand trial. Um, if she can stand trial, we are going to hold her accountable irrespective of her mental health issues. And if she is not competent to stand trial, we are going to ask that she is placed somewhere where she can get the treatment she needs, not in our community. So placed somewhere inpatient so that we can be safe, right? Um, I think a lot of people agree that people with mental health issues need treatment. Um, we're just disagreeing about where they should get it. Some people think it should be in jail. I think it should be in a facility that's actually set up to help them with the problem, the root cause of their problem. But we both agree that if you are violent in our community, irrespective of why the, what the reason is, you need to be removed from the community. What's your goal ultimately with this? So my goal is, um, and thank you for asking that, my goal is to make sure that the people that come in contact with our municipal and district courts or with the criminal justice system and are filtered there 
that we just pause for a moment and see if we can get them in contact with the different entities that are there to help them. Um, if they are violent, I do want to hold them accountable for sure. Um, but we spend way too much time on those cases when we have um, multiple non-fatal shootings that happened over July 4th weekend, let's say. And I'm very proud to say that over that weekend, nobody was killed. Last July 4th weekend, six people lost their lives. Um, I'm happy no one lost their lives, but any number of non-fatal shootings is too many. And we need to work and spend our resources on solving those non-fatal shootings, which I'm happy to say we made an arrest um, with respect to the July 4th shooting of a 30-year-old man and an 8-year-old child. Um, I was just at that arraignment this morning in Roxbury Division of the Boston Municipal Court. Um, we are working hard and collaborating with the Boston Police Department. We are getting dangerous people off of the streets and um, removing them from the community so we can be safe. That's where I want to focus my attention, is these violent, serious crimes, um, as opposed to traffic violations and other situations that are civil in nature, some of them, um, and are clogging up the system. Massachusetts has one of the, no the lowest, if not the lowest, incarceration rates in the country. But some critics say that there are numbers hidden in that that really don't tell the story, mm -hmm. right? So we may have the least amount of people in jail, but there are categories, convicted versus pretrial. Mm -hmm. Is what you're trying to do getting at the heart of that? Yeah, so there's a couple layers that are really important, and I do need to give credit to Massachusetts. We do have one of the lowest incarceration rates, but we have an incredibly high um, rate of disparities between who is incarcerated and who isn't. So if African Americans make up less than, let's say, you know, 20% of the total population, but are over 50 or 60% of the incarcerated population. And that goes even higher when we look at individuals that are 18 to 24 years old for African Americans and Latinx individuals. Those are numbers I want to look at. If the overwhelming number of people that are serving time in the Suffolk County House of Corrections are pre-trial detainees, meaning they have not gone to trial yet, you are innocent until proven guilty. Right? And if the only reason you are being held is because you can't afford bail, that's a problem to me. Because no matter what color you are, it's a wealth-based disparity. If you are poor, you wait, await your trial inside of the Suffolk County House of Corrections or Nashua Street. And if you are rich, you don't. And I don't think that's fair. And what the, the country, not just Suffolk County, but the country is seeing, people like Epstein and others whom are able to use their wealth to flaunt um, and, and, um, and navigate their, their way through a system as a result of being able to afford the best lawyers, um, when those are dangerous people that are free. So if the system is broken and individuals are held only because they're poor, I want to expose that and I want to try to explain it better. Um, and then I also want to try to change those disparities um, by focusing on making sure we're only holding people that are, that are um, flight risks or not going to return and they have proven that they will not return to court. Because remember, all bail is, is will you come back? Mm -hmm. And if it is a dangerous issue, then I want to make sure we give your defense attorney an opportunity to zealously defend you in a dangerousness hearing. And that's the way the system should work. If I can't prove that you should be held on bail, you shouldn't be held on bail. And if I can't prove that you are dangerous and should be held based on dangerousness, then you shouldn't be. And as the minister of justice, essentially, that we all are as prosecutors, um, we have a really high burden to make sure that we are always getting it right. And I'm really proud to say that almost every person I've met in this office that I inherited from Dan Conley gets it right and firmly believes in, um, in the, the duty we have to make sure that things are fair and equitable. Um, I'm just making sure we're speaking out loud about it a little more. In speaking to people about, you know, your trajectory, some along my line of work and also just regular people have called you a bold reductionist. Would you agree with that? Bold reductionist. Well, bold certainly. Um, you know, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think 
reductionist in some circumstances, right? I want to reduce the amount of time that we are spending on non-serious, non-violent crimes, but I want to increase the amount of time that we are focusing our resources on non-fatal shootings and the 20 plus homicides we've had since I've taken office here. Um, I'm proud of the work that we do with law, our law enforcement partners, but I want more um, arrests regarding these crimes. I want to make sure that we're able to call these families to say, we believe we found the person that did this to your loved one and we're going to hold them accountable and let's explain to you all of the different ways that we can do that. Mm -hmm. Up to and including incarceration um, and then maybe some other examples of what we can do to get them closure and accountability. Because I would also never try to impart what I believe accountability looks like to every single family that is impacted by, by violence, they look at things very, very differently. What have you been able to accomplish so far? So, um, I've been able to accomplish, I think, a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, communication with my staff. Uh, we have made some changes in that we meet quarterly now. Um, we are very siloed. We all show up in different places. Um, I am excited that we've had town halls. We're having quarterly town halls as well. I'm excited about the fact that we created a discharge integrity team, which is the first in the country where um, I have four individuals that when there's an officer involved shooting, they are not part of the DA's office that sit outside of this office and we meet to determine whether or not the shooting was reasonable or not. Um, and I'm really proud that that's the first one that was set up in the United States. Um, I'm excited about my memo, the fact that I'm one of the first DAs or a handful of DAs that are actually putting things in writing so that we can be held accountable, so that the criminal defense bar and very candidly judges, um, probation, community members and law enforcement can all look and say, okay, I agree with this, but I don't agree with that. I think we're having much needed conversations uh, that haven't happened in the past about the system and whether it's working or not. Because let's be very clear, it's working really well for certain people and not for others. And what I want is just for it to work the same for everyone. This is not bringing things down. I want to bring it all up so that everyone gets um, to feel as though, even they might not like the outcome, because if I'm sending you away, you might not be happy with that, but you will understand the process. It will be explained to you in the language of your origin, um, because I believe if we can take away your liberty, you shouldn't understand that 72%. You should understand it 100%. I'm very proud of the fact that we sued ICE and um, our preliminary injunction was granted. I was adamant about that. Um, I believe firmly that the place to challenge our government is in court, and we did that um, in that circumstance. And I'm excited that I hope we're going to be challenging a few other, um, other um, behaviors that we believe are not uh, compliant with the Constitution or common law. And so I'm really proud, actually, of this. I'm, I'm a little tired, but <laughs> I'm really proud of these first six months. Um, I'm proud that the commissioner and I stand shoulder to shoulder anytime there's a fatal shooting together in this community to explain what it is that happened. I'm proud that, uh, I'm not proud that there have been two officer involved shootings, um, but I'm happy that in one of them, um, the officer that was injured himself is recovering. Um, officer Whalen is his name, and I'm happy to say that um, he is, uh, I hope, going to be able to return to the force, but a person lost their life in that encounter. Um, and it's my job as a neutral um, investigator to see what it is that happened there so that those two families that are going to be impacted um, forever as a result of that one encounter that evening um, can move forward with their lives with some amount of closure. So. I have an incredibly um, important role as the DA. I'm honored to um, join the ranks of Ralph Martin and Newman Flanagan and John Pappas and Dan Conley. Um, but you know, it is a hard job, and I I give 110 percent every day. Your professional career has been marked with a lot of first, and it seems like you're passing the torch as you take on this new role, so that the office also changes as times change. Yeah. So I'm excited. Uh, we have a um, 
a female chief of staff that's a woman of color. Um, my uh, head of press right now, who is sitting off camera, is a, a woman. Um, I have uh, my first assistant is um, equally uh, fantastic, um, who has a lived experience that's very different than many people in this office. He was a former chief of the gang unit, but um, has personal experience with homicide and addiction. Um, I have a woman general counsel. Um, and so we, I'm proud to have the first female chief of the gang unit under my administration um, who's doing a wonderful job. The other thing I try to do is the two ADAs that handled the big arraignments we had in the EMS stabbing and the July 4th uh, shooting, um, I brought them both on camera with me when I presented to the media what was happening. I wasn't the one that stood up and handled this arraignment. I'm the DA, yes, but I want to make sure the people that do the hard work and are um, in the trenches every day get the credit that they deserve by saying their name and being on camera and answering questions if they feel comfortable. Um, and hearing me say out loud, um, I thank you for your service, as does Suffolk County. So we're changing things and passing the torch. Um, you know, I'm proud that when I left Massport as one of the first women and people of color, um, a woman succeeded me, right, who then became the chief of staff for the CEO, um, and a woman succeeded her. So we are, um, we are making sure that we are getting the most qualified people. Gender is irrelevant, but it's also wonderful when we are able to break some glass ceilings on the way. Lastly, let's talk about your life story. You're very candid with your experience. In, when we shadowed you, um, you weren't shy to talk about where you come from to young women. Why do you decide to do that and be so blunt and, and share that? Yeah, so you, I think you saw me speak to some young people uh, that were with um, some Boston police officers, some female police officers. And one of the things I love to say to young people, but people overall is, you know, I have, if you look at my resume, you believe you know who the person is. And yes, I'm really fortunate to have gone to some wonderful schools and um, had some amazing jobs and, and trained at the feet of some of the best lawyers in Boston and quite frankly in the country. Um, but I also have a lived experience that's very different. I'm the oldest of five children. I have siblings that are incarcerated or struggling with um, addiction and are in recovery, I'm proud to say. As a result of that, I'm the guardian of two of my nieces. Um, I'm the mother of a wonderful 15-year-old, and my life has been made all the better by being essentially the guardian or the kinship foster for my six and 10-year-old niece. Um, I know what it feels like to have oversight, and D DCF is in my life. Um, and I like to remind people that you can love people and not agree with the choices that they make. And as young people, I think that's harder to understand when you're um, a person that loves your mom or dad and they keep making bad decisions or might have, you know, be struggling with substance use disorder or maybe in and out of jail, right? Um, or you have a sibling that you love very much but is making bad decisions or finds themselves in circumstances where they feel they have no other choice but to protect themselves and might have a weapon. Um, you can still make choices that you're not going to do that. You can still make choices that you're going to do as well in school as possible. And very candidly, you can still make choices that you're going to talk to a counselor at your school or someone you trust to say, I'm, I need help making decisions um, because I don't feel safe where I am. And that doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you somebody who's taking care of yourself. And that is why I tell the story as often as I can that there are tough choices I still have to make as a 48-year-old person. So imagine if you're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 struggling with this. Um, you don't get to choose who your parents are. You don't get to choose where you live when you're that age. There are so many decisions that are made for you and mental, mental illness is real. It's very, very real. Um, it is just as important that we take care of our mental health as we take care of our physical health. So I try as often as I can to be vulnerable or share things that might, you know, I might not feel proud about, but I feel I have a duty to tell people that I deal with this every day myself and they should never um, feel like they're alone in those circumstances.
we're really lucky that we have a mayor uh, like Mayor Walsh and a commissioner like Commissioner Gross. Um, the three of us uh, went and met with the eight-year-old victim um, who we are happy to say is going to survive, but I remind people this is an eight-year-old that is the um, is a gunshot wound victim and um, her physical wounds are going to heal but the trauma of being shot um, and experiencing that is is going to take a lot longer to heal than those physical wounds. The mayor, the commissioner and I did um, visit with her. She was in wonderful spirits. Um, we met her family, a close-knit family, um, loving family that was very supportive of her and I'm happy to say that you know, I asked her some of the things she liked and we, I was able to drop off, uh, she's an artist, so I was able to drop off some wonderful um, gifts for her and tell her just, um, I'm wishing her recovery. But uh, the mayor and the commissioner and I, and I have gone to homes uh, too many times, quite frankly. We, we were with Jassy Carrera's family immediately after that horrific incident happened. Um, and they're not visits that are pleasant at all, but it's the right thing to do to tell people we're working hard and we're sorry for their loss and to look into their face um, and to feel what it is that they're experiencing um, and to never assume that we know that. Um, one of the things I'm proud of is we have a licensed clinical social worker that's our chief victim witness advocate. Um, she not only talks about wellness with my staff but with the families of um, victims of, of violence, right? And that's not just homicide. It's it's non-fatal shootings, it's sexual assaults. Um, I'm proud that as the DA, we're also gonna be starting something like an Office of Survivor Services because our victim witness advocates assist you through the legal process, but there are so many other hurdles that you have to go over when you, um, or a loved one is, um, is, has been victimized or, um, or has experienced a violent crime. And so in the circumstance of a homicide or a sexual assault, if the individual is in school and needs to get, um, you know, uh, deal with the school to make sure that their grades um, are not going to be impacted or they need to take a little bit of time off, we want to assist with that. If it's a family that now has to take in children as a result of a loved one being, um, you know, incapacitated or in, in the worst case scenario killed or having to um, live through the trauma of, a, of an assault, we want to assist with you transferring those children into a new school system. Or if they're gonna be living with you, how do you get a bigger apartment if you're on a Section 8 voucher or you need to move to a different neighborhood? When you're dealing with trauma, um, there's no right or wrong way to deal, but I can tell you dealing with bureaucracy is not um, a positive way to deal with your trauma. We want to help you with that. We want to guide you through um, this maze that you unfortunately are going to have to experience due to no fault of your own. So I'm really proud um, to work with my partners, Mayor Walsh and Commissioner Gross, um, but also the excellent people in my office who every day show up and do everything they can to help um, victims and survivors and their families.